Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Wayne Peasant Radio Show. Did you like that really uh, stirring intro music I had, Brad? I miss our other, I miss our other intro stuff. It's my favorite part of the show. You yeah, that. that's one of the things we got to get together finally. Here is our act, basically. <laughs> 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 that's, that's not going to happen, Tom. Yeah, well, well, all right. Well, they say aim for the bullseye. Don't don't expect to hit it. That's all. <laughs> anyway, how are you this evening? I'm doing well, sir. How about yourself? I am doing just fine. We're slowly getting more snow again. We are. Is Lo it? Lovely seeing you in person. Great to see you. I think that's going to uh, end for a while. For a little while, yes, it is. You're going back to the hinterlands. I don't. Know. You, you, it's a long laundry list of places I'm going, so we're not yeah. even going to go there. But hey, in the North Woods, you're going to miss all this beautiful snow. Well, actually, you're going to get snow, and then it's going to get nice and sunny out the rest of the week, Thursday, Friday, I think. So and cold. Cold, but pretty. Yeah. But pretty. That's right. So welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the Northern Peasant Radio Show. We're happy to be on Freedom Talk Radio. Um, and thanks to them for having us. Um, if you are not familiar with us, we invite you to find us on Facebook. Um, just search Annoying Peasant Radio. And you'll uh, be able to follow us. You can click the like there with the rest of the folks that have found us. And we're working on getting the rest of the stuff on uh, Freedom Talk Radio from our switch to Walk Talk up and running like the sound and maybe even how we're going to do the show next week, being apart and yes. the little things like that. But we'll be here somehow. And, and if you're not familiar with us, I'm Tom. And the guy that you can see sitting right next to me on my right <laughs> is Brad. So... And I, I, there's a possibility my friend Joe is listening right here on the lake. And Trigger says he's listening live tonight, too. So i got to say hello to those guys, and thanks for joining us if, if you're doing so. Absolutely. How rude of me to not introduce us. Oh. No. It's Tom and Brad, and we, uh, we, are the annoying peasant, the, we are the annoying peasants. Boy, are we. <laughs> <laughs> In so many ways. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so we talk about liberty on this show, um, and I think that that's the other thing that's sort of interesting for us to see how we fit into Freedom Talk uh, radios lineup and all. But I think we'll, that will sort itself out over time. I think we'll we're hoping to learn from them, and I think that uh, maybe they'll even learn a few things from us. And we look forward to maybe in the future having some good chats with uh, some of the other hosts on that network. So, uh, again, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, oh, I also have to say, contrary to popular belief, as Brad has said before, we're not in a bunker with aluminum foil over our plastic hard hats. <laughs> Close, but we're not. <laughs> we are not. We are all about um, peaceful. Wow, there you go. Pe peaceful means to uh, resolve uh, and, and bring back liberty. Organized maybe there society. never was liberty, yeah. Tom might argue. I would, but, yeah. that, but we don't have that Before time. the Constitution? Uh, yeah, because we had these, those dudes oh, that yeah, came over there. Yeah, they read the guy he was red. cranky. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Okay, all right, well, we're in a ditch already. Yeah. Okay, but we're all about uh, peaceful means. We're not about uh, uh, aggressive, but... Uh, gathering arms and uh, doing bad things to other people and the, for the sake of liberty. I think there are lots of those that are out there that would. It would be the height of hypocrisy to use aggressive force to right. impose a system that says, hey, we shouldn't be using aggressive force. Right? And there we go. Um, and we shouldn't be violating people's property rights to say, hey, you shouldn't be violating people's property rights. That's right. Okay, and, that, and that's probably the core of where I, let me just add quickly, I, I wrote a short thing, you know, uh, hey, Annoying Peasant Radio is essentially a discussion centered on the political philosophy of liberty. We are aiming to educate people about, you know, what a free society is and how it might operate and to show that it is, in fact, different and, uh, and a vast improvement over our current society. And the current society thing, you know, we were talking earlier already today that that tips people in the ditch. It's like, well, what do you mean? I won't have this government office just down the road or I won't have this if uh, that's craziness that just can't work mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I think part of it is the people need to understand both the, the philosophical aspects because that's the glue that connects all these issues mm -hmm. I would argue and then also uh, we, we go through a lot of news stories and other things to try to give uh, examples of where your rights are violated and how they might not be violated if we had a free society Perfect. And I think for me, because Tom has taught me many, many things, and I try to play the role of the contrarian here, uh, sometimes better, sometimes worse, but for me, um, I think 
I've concluded that what it boils down to is that I believe that we do have an alternative to what our current structure is in government and that we could do it peacefully. Tom, I think, has been able to teach me that. And uh, that that what we have today is very, very, very flawed. I think I felt, felt that before, but I didn't know what alternatives there were. So I'll just challenge you to stick with us. We hope that we make you think. Um, and we talk about a lot of stuff, and sometimes we get uh, a little bit off in the ditch, as we say, on a tangent. But And sometimes we even talk around in circles. But we're, this is very philosophically based uh, principles that Tom speaks to. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. Um, I was, I had actually had a thought, and I lost it. I hate that. <laughs> and I know you disputed that that I actually had a thought yeah. in the first place. Yeah. But I was going to add something there. But you, what is Tuesday? It is Tuesday, so I don't or Wednesday or Thursday or whatever day it is. I'm always lost. Anyway, I don't know if if, if you had something else or if we wanted to chat about. Let's see, I got a somewhere here. I got a list. We we're going to talk about some of the things that are happening in the news, Crimea, Russia, blah, blah, blah. As we, as we tend to do a lot. Yep. Um, by the way, I haven't paid attention. Have you any news on the uh, Flight 370 thing? I must admit that I'm glued to that. I just think it is. I was telling my wife over the weekend, I think that this is one of those events that over history, <laughs> I think we're all going to remember where we were and whatever else when this came about. I think that there's a lot of yet things yet to unfold. You, Mr. Aeronautical Engineer, might have some better thoughts, but uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a crazy thing. I, I don't know the latest, uh, other than they're still looking, and, and boy, it just seems to me like there's a narrow band of possibilities uh, that, that uh, so many people, I think, are pretty far off on the deep end on, but who knows is the point. On these, and I haven't looked, admittedly, in days, which puts me eons behind in the developing story, but I just am fascinated by the comments of people to, to articles. Not actually the articles, oh, yeah. but the comments, you know, and people, one was aliens. Some people ask really interesting questions. Who was on the plane that a government would want to get rid of? Yeah. Um, you know, did the pilots do it supposedly? They're, one of the things I heard, which, again, was days ago, that the transponder was purposefully turned off. Yep. Uh, I don't, are they sticking with? That? I think so. I think that they're they're calling potential foul play is certainly one of the things. The I guess Malaysia is not the most uh, politically subdued country, True. and so I, I heard that this uh, this one of the pilots was very active uh, uh, against, I think, the current administration. So you're saying if I was on that plane, you'd be thinking I did it? Is that well, what you just told me? Th that's why you get the cavity searches. <laughs> and that's why <laughs> I got the plastic the helmet on with the aluminum foil over the top. <laughs> no, nah, never mind. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it's, it's a very, very fascinating story. I don't think we would either claim to be a um, an expert on any of these topics, but... Yeah. I think what we both find fascinating, as you've already mentioned, is everybody's reaction to things. Yeah. And, and, and not only that, but everybody's reaction to, just think about as you watch the news media and, and blogs and whatever, is look at how people react to how quickly they react. I think one of the things I observed over the weekend is how quickly people react to, we need more government intervention, and this wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened that way. And that's a very quick knee-jerk reaction, and, and that's one of the things that, that jumped out at me over the weekend. That was actually, and we're, we'll get to it, but Robert Higgs, I actually posted on the Facebook page uh, days ago, I don't remember when that was, <clears throat> and he gave an impassioned uh, speech, presentation, maybe is a better word, um, most emotional, m emotional state I've seen him ever before, and I love the guy, I think he's brilliant. Um, and he was talking about the national security state and how people run to the state for security. Interesting topic. I'd encourage you go to our annoying uh, the Facebook page at Annoying Peasant Radio, and you probably have to scroll down a little ways because Tommy's posting all kinds of cool stuff on there. So I'll also go there for that. Uh, a ton of well, one of the ones and almost every single one that Tommy puts on there is excellent. But one one that stuck out in my mind was uh, what was it? If you can't trust people with freedom. How could you trust people with authority? That's great. Yeah. There's, I mean, and people, I know, get flipped in the ditch. 
Um, and the conversation I had with Joe earlier today, you got to wait and let the context develop as Brad alluded to. You got to stick with us and think we're corny. So have fun with the corniness part. But there's actually a message in here or a number of them. Mm -hmm. So if you stick there and you, you'll get them. And I try to explain to people, I was reading heavily. I'm still reading. By the way, I read an entire half a book. And I can't remember the title I, on Monday, yesterday. I read because I just got so interested and I looked up. I'm like, man. Anyway, um, so it, it requires that context and it takes a while to build that. And again, I wouldn't use us as your only source either. Yep. Maybe just as an inspiration and then go do some reading, learning, thinking on your own. Yeah, we always say that uh, you can't apply liberty only in a vacuum, that uh, it needs to be applied broadly. And um, I think we also would challenge you early on, one of the things we talked about um, before we were on this network a lot is, you know, what is liberty? We're going to talk about that again a lot. But, always. But uh, that, not only that, but, but uh, I, th I had the opinion that, we all had liberty, that liberty was around us like an, an inert gas, like oxygen that we breathe. And um, and so we'll challenge you on thinking about that in particular. We hope we make you think. We don't know, we, uh, we don't expect you to change and believe as we uh, speak or we address things or uh, be an immediate convert, but we would challenge you to think and we appreciate you listening. Absolutely. And by the way, I got to also give my appreciation to Luke and Tanya. I had a, I think I had about a six hour conversation with them on Saturday. So just a little one. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun and they're full of great ideas. And, and yes, Lucas, I haven't calculated your geometry problem yet. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> he already gave me crap about that. But nice. Anyway, fantastic that you guys are listening. I appreciate it. Anyway, so we're going to talk a little bit about Crimea in a, in a moment. Let me get to my thing here. And then there's an article on Reason.com that's entitled, America is in no position to lecture Russia about imperialism. Um, then there was an article on Yahoo, Yahoo News about uh, Russian state TV we'll get to. Um, there's a thing on CBS Sunday Morning News about uh, children of vets and PTSD. We'll get to the proper title and all that for you. And then if we get a chance, I'd like to talk a little bit more about Dr. Robert Higgs' presentation that he gave. Uh, of all places, it was actually took place in Washington, D.C., and boy, he was really going off on the parasites, the lobbyists, and the whole thing, and, mm. uh, you know, uh, some people think, ah, it's just a guy talking, but take some courage to stand there in the Capitol and say this stuff, and he's completely undeterred, and that's, again, one of the many things I admire about the guy, other than the fact that I think he's absolutely brilliant, but anyway, that's the rundown of what we're going to go with, so... Unless you had something else, if you want to go to the Crimea thing. Let's do it. Let's get to it. Yeah, the Crimea thing is interesting from a, a zillion standpoints. Um, the, again, the latest one, I'm not up on to the latest news. I, don't, I, I know that the people of Crimea voted, and when I say voted, I don't know exactly what form they, yep. they do that there. I don't know exactly what that means, but supposedly, overwhelmingly, they supported the to. Uh, uh, stick to or or go to Russia that and, and I believe that that geography there is very important I think it's on uh, I want I wanted to say the Black Sea, but I may be wrong It's on it's it's on a port there and that's why strategically important to Russia Now all of the political alliances that go on there. There's got to be a zillion but I wanted to step back a little bit okay, so prior to kind of this recent uprising Ukraine was as I am told and what I have read is a little uh, back and forth, like kind of the, let me think, the eastern half, and I don't know if half is exactly the right word, but eastern portions were more, were cozier to Russia, western portions were a little cozier to Europe, and they were, ang you know, they were trying to figure out how to to solve that little issue, and I, when I say little issue, obviously it's not a little Huge. issue. Um, and then the whole uprising came, and I don't even know what they call their group, but uh, I can't remember the fellow's name who was there. He turns out in a, in a five-star hotel in Moscow there a week or two later. Yep. That's not so bad. I mean, right. if you really think about it, five-star hotel, I can 
Right. I think I could deal with that. Probably some good vodka there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've heard they had it. Yeah. Um, but so, but the U.S. kind of stood by the sidelines and let that happen. And when I say stood by the sidelines, I don't know. There could have been all kinds of aid happening under the table that I'm not a privy to and we're not aware of, right? Who knows? But the public appearance was that they more or less did nothing. Said, "Hey, it's a rebellion. That's fine. No, let the people hash it out and figure out what they want to do internally, right?" Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that sort of what the Crimea thing was? Those people used the democratic process to put it to a vote. Mm -hmm. But now uh, John Kerry and the Obama administration aren't real happy about this whole deal, right? Saying they won't recognize that Crimea is is cozying up to Russia. Um, and, and that begins, well, maybe not begins, but that's a, certainly a part of the pissing match that's going on between the U.S. and, and Russia. So, <laughs> excuse me, I, I thought, you know, it's it's hypocritical at the very least, <laughs> and and worse uh, to be sure. And that's what led me to the next article. But before we do that, I don't know your thoughts on that or anything you wanted to say. How, uh, relate how this this pertains to liberty. Well, we, would you please? The you know the broad the easy one is well if we did have a free society here we'd have no state so. In other words, there would be no John Kerry Obama administration going over there. And when I say over there, in this case, it's Ukraine, right? And and of course, they've met in other places in Europe, etc. But you know, we only be trying to throw our influence around, our political influence. And and the trouble with that partly is, let's say I'm sitting here on uh, frozen lacuterie, and I'm let's let's just say I wasn't too keen with what our, in quotes, government is doing. I have no way of stopping this, right? The whole point is I get sucked along with supporting whatever John Kerry wants, whether I actually support it or not. Mm -hmm. People say, well, you can vote, vote against them. Hey, in fact, I did. Mm -hmm. So, right? And, and that that's a, that book I was reading yesterday I was telling about, I, I have a lot to say about democracy. I do think it's basically a, a mechanism to socialism, but that's a whole broad, there we go. Topic. But People so the point turn is, off the radios everywhere. Yeah. Did you hear all those clicks? Yeah. <laughs> or their iPods or whatever. No, okay, wait. All right. So so go ahead. So I think first of all, that wouldn't exist. So all this meddling wouldn't exist. I would agree with I'll use uh, Ron Paul's words, meddling. And and if people think, well, we're just trying to uh, get people to understand what liberty or freedom is and try to get them to be free. Well, first of all, you cannot, I can't impose freedom on you. You have to seize it for yourself or not, mm -hmm. right? You, and, and the broadest, simplest terms are, if you're a slave, you have to obtain your own freedom. You can't just expect it to be handed to you. No one's, why, if I held you as a slave, why would I just give you up? I have economic benefit and other benefit to hold you as a slave, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to take your freedom back. And that doesn't necessarily mean forcefully. And I would argue it can't mean using force. But, right, so to expect that someone would give it to you is, I guess, unreasonable expectations. Or I shouldn't say, I guess, it is. Um, so, so all the, Hang on, let me do it really there. Yeah. So, so you are calling us as citizens yes. slaves to the state. Yes. Okay. Well, I'll just call us slaves. Okay. Um, because... And, and that's obviously strong, provocative... Distasteful, all that stuff. Yes, right. That's not how you get more listeners, by yeah, the way. <laughs> but 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 it is. I believe it is true. I think it's a very strong way to state it. But in the end, when you cut everything out of it, that's kind of what we are. If we have no say, is that not your point? If you have no say as an indentured servant to policy, to any sort of policy, any sort of position that those who quote unquote represent us, right? Yes, it depends. But on they what... don't represent us. Exactly. <laughs> but because you say, when you say you have your say, that's ambiguous. What mm -hmm. do you mean when you? Because most people say, "Well, you have your say." Yeah, you, we can vote. Right, you can vote. So you have. We're your free, say. dude. So, but what I'm, I alluded to earlier that democracy is not this salvation that everybody thinks it is. Is because it's majority rule. It it isn't freedom rules. It's majority rules. That's what a democracy is. Okay. So it has nothing to do with freedom, okay. right? It's the will of the majority will be imposed on the minority. That's what that is. Mm -hmm. You say, well, there should be some restraint on that. Great. What restraint is my question? And in re 
so there's a whole long litany of things that we can get into there of what restraint. But look at the state, the discussion I had with my friend Joe earlier today. Uh, he says, well, I, I posed the question to him, well, if I think anarchy is so great or anarcho-capitalism, well, and, and it has been known basically since Aristotle and developed since then, of course. Well, if it's such a great idea, how come, how come it's not in place anywhere? You know, good, what are we, just too dumb to know? Mm -hmm. and I'm, no, there's people want to dominate other people or have authority over them. Rulers want to rule the rule, right? That's how you do it. So that's the impetus. And the people who are willing to be ruled, they let it happen, and therefore they will be ruled. They have to say, no, I don't recognize this authority over me. I'm free. Okay? And I think I didn't answer your point directly, and that's only because my memory is really good but short. No, I'm just, I'm just trying to challenge as the voice of our listeners that, that says, wow, this guy's saying that we're slaves. Holy cow, I'm a free man in this U.S. of A. Yeah, you just jarred that bolts loose to me. If, yeah, yeah. Let's say you were a slave of mine in the traditional sense. Basically, you have nothing, and every single thing you produce is mine, and you have no property. It's all mine. Okay, which, okay. Is, which is, actually, as a sidebar, what I read over the weekend, that there is still millions of people on this earth uh -huh. that are in that, that are sense. slaves. Yes. Okay. But, <clears throat> so... It, but I, we don't think of it in our country, sorry, but we don't think of it in this country, hey, though we had those days, we're not, we don't have, the, we, that was abolished. Right? right, it's abolished, and by the way, let me add, and we'll get back to this, like, but the, one of the leading voices for abolition was Lysander Spooner, who was an anarchist, by the way, so right. let me bring this up. But, so if, if I owned everything that you produced and you had held no private property, it was all mine, I think most people would agree that's the traditional definition of slavery, right? Okay. Fine. What I if, agree with that. Okay, so we kind of have a basis there. But what if I let you have, say, 1% of what you own, and I only took, of, of what you produce, sorry, and I only held nine, only took 99% of it? Is well, that slavery? I could get a royalty. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the question becomes, is that slavery? And some uh, people, It's a better deal than I had before. It is a better deal than you had before. But what this is is a continuum problem. Because okay. if you say, well, 99%, yeah, that's still slavery, because that's a whole lot, right? How about 98? How about 97? How about 50%? Is this a trick question? Yeah, because it's a <laughs> continuum problem, right? <laughs> the whole point is it would be your judgment, and you might say the number 37, say, and I might say the number 63, right? And, and of course, I wouldn't, but, right? So it's, you, who's to say what the right number is? So what I would say is you should tolerate no slavery, none, not even a reduced form of slavery, Right? Because okay. it's a violation of your property rights and the non aggression axiom, which again we'll get to. But just okay. so, so I'm not enslaved now, though, Tom. I'm, I'm a free guy. Oh, contraire. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, pitching softballs tonight? <laughs> I am. So, any. I would, so, no, I, I, I get to. I, I don't. I'm not obligated to anybody, am I? Did you. Have you. Try not paying your property tax or your income tax. And the way around that, by the way, is make no income, then you don't have to pay income tax. But <laughs> right? So what what yeah, is but it? Now we're now we're into the meat of things. Yes. It's coercion, basically, or the threat thereof. And you are in fact coerced to pay those taxes. And I know and Higgs talked about this, and I would strongly encourage you to listen to Dr. Robert Higgs's uh, presentation again on the Facebook page. But he talks about the state exists through extortion. But they don't say extortion because people tend to cringe at that word. So they call it taxation. And it is, in principle, it's exactly the same thing. It's a highway robber, only worse. A highway robber puts you in slavery temporarily. Right? He comes up to you with a gun and says, your money or your life. Right? Mm -hmm. The point is, when you... People say, well, if you hand over the money, well, wait a minute, it's only you'd hand over the money, I'm assuming you would, if you hand over the money, because your alternative is what you would gather as a worse alternative, right? So you take the lesser two evils. Why? Because I am, I threatened you in order to get that exchange to happen. 
And I'm saying that's exactly what the state is, except for worse. Again, that's my little caveat. But, right, if you don't pay your taxes, something worse is going to happen to you. The state is going to do something else. They're going to seize your property. They're going to threaten you with jail, right? And they do have, according to this society, they have the authority to ultimately put you to death for that, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that the state can sentence you to death in numerous ways. We talked about an article about the yep. death penalty. We're going to talk about that maybe later. But the other way they do it is through conscription, which is the draft, right? Which at the moment we don't have, but throughout the history of the country we've had. And uh, if you were in the battlefield and your commander said, hey, stand right there in front of that cannon, if you don't, it's disobeying orders, right? You're court-martialed. Yeah. If you do, that's essentially uh, sentencing you to death if you know it's a certain death. Okay. So the state does clearly have the authority over putting you to death if it so deems. So That's undeniable. Okay, so succinctly, because we could talk about this until we could do the, the whole hour on this and not get to the top of the, the day. The calendar flips pages, but yeah. but I drove down this path for a reason because I wanted to give our listeners a flavor for for some of the perspectives that you take. And and yes, some of the things that that Tom might say, um, and probably I'll say, uh, are going to be offensive to you. Um, but I think if you cut to the chase on things, what Tom just said about slavery, if you are what you know? What what percentage is a fair amount of being enslaved? Is is I think one of the questions that you should be asking yourself. By the way, for the homework answer, the number is zero. Anyway, <laughs> I had to. don't get. But but uh, philosophically, do you think it's fair to you for you to be enslaved? And I know what most people are thinking. They're saying, well, of course, we got to pay for the roads, right? right? We got to pay for this. We got to pay for the mail. You got to pay for these things. So yeah, you got to give your fair share. And in fact, people have, again, listen to Higgs, he says, people have been convinced it's their moral obligation to do so. Well, by the way, I think you have a moral obligation to hand me a lot of your money, too. It doesn't seem to work, right? Well, and then the other very, very facetious thing that we talk about all the time is, in a democracy, um, what if we all made a motion and we got it through the state and the local all the way up to the federal that we think that uh, Tom and I should have all of Warren Buffett's money. Yes, majority rules. That's majority no rules. If we can get everybody to say, yep, because uh, Tom and Brad will do better with that money than Warren will. And so, so you think I'm nuts saying that. But think about some of the other legislation that we are passing uh, every single day and how very narrow focused it is. Yes, and it's there to benefit uh, the, the elitists and the connected. Yes. That's the, that giant hammer I call the state that's laying on the table, you and I can't pick it up. We're small fries. Right. We need help to pick it up. It's the guys with the big cash and the influence. You ever hear this little show called House of Cards? <laughs> Frank Underwood? Yep. <laughs> right? And <clears throat> hey, I saw a Kevin Spacey interview once and he said, Hey, this really isn't too far from the truth. <laughs> and right. I, I, my fear on that show again, since we're off the, we're, we're on, on the spur another, there, we're on another planet right yeah. now. But go ahead. Um, what was I going to say? The way these guys, my fear of the show, I should say, or people's interpretation of the show is they're going to say, "Well, this show is about just some kind of loony guys who got in there, right? And if we had the right folks in those in the right spots, none of this crap would happen." My argument is that the state provides the incentives for even a good, quote-unquote, guy to go in there to do the wrong thing. Because the incentives simply are not there to uh, handle the state affairs like a lot of people say would be uh, appropriate. They say that, but of course, when they get their finger on the trigger, they get to play with it and look at things go haywire. Yeah. And, and like uh, one of the things Tanya posted, hey, how many times do we have to vote in order to get things straightened out? Right. Thing voting doesn't work. Talk, hey, go watch the George Carlin thing about voting. That was that'll make you laugh. But so, he's so there's a lot of recurring things that we talk about on the show, and I and I I deliberately drove this point of slavery. Yes, we were talking about the Crimea and the Ukraine, but um, I was trying to drive this point to try to to get people's attention a little bit about one of the key perspectives that Tom's going to bring up recurringly. 
And so I, I think I think we've done that. We probably left some questions out there, but we're gonna. I think we should move on. What do you think? Probably yes. And we probably left a ton of questions. And we did. And actually, that's a good thing because we. That's our hook. See, are we not the consummate radio professionals? Well, they've long turned us off. Oh, but okay. So that's what those clicks were on <laughs> there. All right. All right. <laughs> All right next. So next item is the, the, and it folds in this very nicely. I think it. Um, this is this reason.com <laughs> article. That's entitled, America is in no position to lecture Russia about imperialism. And it was written by Sheldon Richman, one of my, uh, uh, a great mind from FFF.org, Future of Freedom Foundation. That's what FFF is. And by the way, FFF is where Higgs was speaking. Actually, I don't know how long ago that was, not too long. But they were sponsoring that event in Washington, D.C. that Dr. Robert Higgs spoke at. I just wanted to read like about two paragraphs out of this article. And what, what Sheldon Richman does in this article, he gives a long history of uh, imperialism uh, by America. And he goes into the uh, Spanish-American War. I mean, oh my goodness. It's like all, all this history that I don't have any uh, direct knowledge of. And uh, like when I was supposed to be studying that in school, I didn't do that. But <clears throat> let me just read these couple things. They're interesting, I think. This is right at the very end of the article. And Sheldon Richmond states, here we go, Adams, uh, speaking of, geez, I, I want to get his, was it John Quincy Adams? I think it was. Yes, John Quincy Adams was the main author of the Monroe Doctrine, which announced not only that the United States would stand aloof from Europe's quarrels, but also that the Western Hemisphere was exclusively the U.S. government's sphere of influence. The American continents, by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintain, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers, for any such extension would be taken as dangerous to our peace and safety, i.e. our national security. So keep out of our backyard, Europe, and we'll keep out of yours except Will Williams adds that President Monroe then asserted the right of the United States to support Greek revolutionaries. The, this history doesn't excuse Russia, but it does put Putin's actions in perspective. It also counts for the less than odd reception for President Obama's and Secretary Kerry's sanctimonious utterances, to the extent that Obama and Kerry simply Kerry imply that Russia threatens our peace and safety, they look like fools. In other words, we basically said, hey, the Western Hemisphere, out of bounds, dudes. Don't touch it, right? It's, it's almost like me standing here and saying, hey, I, bet, I wonder if there's gold and silver on the moon. It's mine. I called it. <laughs> but, I mean, come on. That is so ridiculous. Now, I'm not saying I would invite people to come over to have wars in the Western Hemisphere. That's what I'm not saying. But I'm, I'm just saying, look at all childish this Monroe Doctrine sound. And I remember as a kid reading about it, I was like, ooh, you know, ooh, that's pretty serious stuff right, there. Right, right. And, and maybe some people took it seriously, but I think now it's just simply childish and, and, and hypocritical, to say the least. I mean, that we could go on for hours. But I thought it was, it, it fit with the Crimea thing. Okay, so how far off this tangent do we want to go? Here we go. Put your seatbelts on. So, so we talk about having a free society all the time, Tom. Yes, we do. That's what you aspire towards, maybe not in our generation, but generations to come, right? That's why we're that's why we do this show. Yes. So in a free society, hypothetical question number one. Okay. Would we were then a collected bunch of people doing cooperative exchange? Yes. And respecting each other's property rights in, in a in a perfect world, correct? Yes. And how would we care how would we be involved? with other countries as as in such a circumstance well what would what would what would your philosophies reflect back to well again it, it would be as simple you can i'll use a maybe a little closer analogy for the moment if you were three blocks over from me and you were hammering a board mm -hmm. i don't see you as any threat to me because i wouldn't even be aware mm -hmm. of what you're doing exactly right so the action would be no action. I'd be going about my business, taking care of whatever it is I need to take care of. I got paint boards over here, so I'd be painting boards while you're over there hammering boards, and I wouldn't even know about it because it's you're not a threat. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, you, you, you don't seem, there's no appearance that you're going to violate my property rights nor aggress against me. So okay. that's what I call, when those two things aren't happening, that's, then it's actually called cooperation. You're actually cooperating with me. Okay. You're over there doing your thing, I'm over here doing my thing, that's called cooperation. The opposite is when we're at war, that's, that's uh, we're using coercive force or at least a threat thereof. Okay. Um, so the answer is what would we be doing? In a sense, nothing, but when I say we, I just cringe always at those pronouns. Let's say I had a cousin who lived in Crimea. He's currently there, right? And I get some email, some communication from him saying that, hey, situation's dire, and I'm all out of cheese. Well, of course, I can take up and send the guy some cheese, my cousin, the cheese. I could even go as far as solicit my neighbors, friends, etc., and say, hey, would you like to donate some cheese for the care package I'm sending to my cousin? All those things are all doable, right? We could even go beyond that if he asked me for a tank, right? I could I could send him a tank if I had the resources to, or I got them together to send him a tank. Okay. Okay. But the thing is, I'm I'm there basically trying to assist an individual, and of course, in my view, I wouldn't be helping him unless he was just trying to protect himself. I wouldn't give him a tank so that he can go kill innocent people, right? That would be my intention. Now. That's not to say that, well, someone else might, right. okay? But as soon as somebody aggresses against somebody else, now you're subject to sanction, right? And you say, who's going to do it? And that's a whole dispute resolution organization that we talked about before. But again, we can't do it, cover every subject tonight. Right. And that's what people try to do, by the way. They do. When you talk to them, what about this? What about this? It's a rapid fire deal. And that doesn't go. You have to sit back, relax, and we have to decide first, is a peaceful society a worthy goal? Is that where we want to get to? Okay, then let's talk about how that might look, right? Okay. And then after, if we even get agreement there, we'll say, okay, how might we get there? But these are three distinct questions, and intermingling them gets people, you know, it, it just becomes a game of, eventually, I think I'm going to get you if you can't answer that question. All right, see you, hold for see you. Somebody wants to got you. Right. Right. And, it, and I know for the detractors of a free society, yes, that's their game. I get it. But I'm going to try not to fall into that trap is the point. Okay. So, so just to conclude before we move on, it would be up to the an individual where they lived, how they wanted to get involved or not get involved. Voluntarily. Voluntarily. In, uh, in a foreign land and in any how it mattered to you. You could send them a plane ticket to get them out of there, right? right? Any means you want, but it has to be voluntary. Okay. Right now, I, and, and again, I don't know all the circumstances, say the United States decides to send $3 billion in aid, what if Thompson are going, or, or, or wait. $10 million in armaments, right? whatever. Whatever. What if I was like, ah, I, I prefer not to do that. Well, right. that percentage of whatever that money is or resources, a mine that was confiscated by from me through taxation, is going there. That's not a voluntary association. That's entirely different than a, a, a coerced association is entirely different than a voluntary association. Okay. Slatum, slavery versus freedom. Okay. Right? Coerced right. versus voluntary. Okay. Thank you for making the point. Check mark. <laughs> okay. Let's move on. This, this one is actually, this was on Yahoo News. My thing says it was 20 hours ago. Was that yesterday or was that a while ago? I don't know if this is updated or not. Um, <clears throat> it's entitled, State TV Says Russia Could Turn U.S. to Radioactive Ash. So, of course, that caught my eye a little bit. And, okay. and when they say state TV, they're talking Russia state TV, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and and it, it was on Yahoo News. So, if you Google that, and what was the guy's name? Stuart Williams. He, he's the one who wrote the article. Anyway, there's this fellow by the name of, whoa, I had it written there. Okay, Dmitry Kiselyov, or Kiselyov. I don't know how to, I think it's Kiselyov is my guess. Easy for you to say. Can we just call him Dmitry? Let's do that. Okay, Dmitry says, well, he's on state <laughs> TV, right? So it's their, one, I assume, one of their, a few of their TV, Russian TV stations. He's basically doing a, I think it's a new show. 
And as he's saying this, that Russia is the only country in the world realistically capable of turning the United States into radioactive ash. By the way, I wasn't there. I'm assuming he said this in Russian. Um, that was supposed to be funny. I get it. Uh, he says this, by the way, on, on his backdrop, now it says large uh, picture of a mushroom cloud. When they say large, I don't know how large. But this is happening in the background while he's saying this. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of stuff that uh, goes on. And, and the little highlight that I have from it, again, is really not directly connected to the actual uh, circumstance we just spoke of. But it says, his program was broadcast as the first exit polls were being published showing an overwhelming majority of Crimeans <coughs> excuse me, voting to leave Ukraine and join Russia. So this is the context in which this is happening. Okay. So all I'm telling you, all you guys who are supporters of the state, and I could care less if the guy's name was Bush, Obama, Clinton, keep going back, right? Bush, right? It doesn't, right. It doesn't matter what name is in there. Of all, the state is the one that's going to help us on these foreign policy issues. Well, how's it working? That's all I got to say, right? This this whole thing of the Russian U.S. Cold War conflict thing is it is it really working out favorably? Now I know you could make the argument. Yes, to my knowledge, nobody has directly been killed in an overt war. Mm -hmm. Although there's all kinds of crap and money being spent on the Cold War thing, and to, I think to argue that the Cold War doesn't exist to this day is a little naive. But again, I'm not going to be able to put, hey, they have 17 spies, we have 32 spies, blah, blah, blah. Right. But you know this crap is going on. Okay. And my money's being spent, by the way. To support it. Yes. And that's where you take the issue. No thank you very much, as they say. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, that I, I don't know if there's anything more to say about that, but look, the stuff that's on Russian TV, if this is accurate reporting, I can't vouch for firsthand, but if that's accurate, and I'm going to argue, not much better here, but... I was going to throw that in myself. <clears throat> All right. All right, the next one is a CBS This Morning segment. Is that the right... CBS Sunday Morning. CBS Sunday Morning. Favorite so. shows on TV. like it a lot. I sent Tom a link to the, uh, I think it was this past Sunday's show, which would have been the 16th. Um, yes. The Where they did an in-depth article. That's the thing I like about the thing. It's not a 20-second highlight of a story. That's, this is happening. They get in and they talk about it. And, and this was a great article about what, Tom? Well, I guess it was really about PTSD. Yeah, uh, overwhelmingly. But there was, a, you know, they start the segment showing a bunch of a bunch, sorry, of soldiers returning from um, in my home state of Indiana. That's that, where the footage was from. It was. was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> they were they're returning from uh, uh, what's what's the right word? The service overseas. Uh, uh, geez, Iraq or Afghanistan? Yeah, yeah, I can't remember what you call. It. Anyway. So they come back from their service, and there's a, you know, basically a little parade, a big welcoming for them coming back. And I was saying, see, this is where I get myself in big trouble. So we're not. Here gonna, we go. We're not going to go too deep down Here the road. Here we go. Of get ready to set off the alarm. Exactly. Sirens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good thing I'm wearing that aluminum yeah, foil covered hard hat. Okay, yeah. Um, anyway, but the the story gets very personal, and that's the part that I thought was a little interesting about this one. So there's this uh, a soldier. His name is I can't remember his first name. His last name is Barton. Okay. Okay. He has a daughter at, at the time of this taping, which I assume was not very long ago. Is a 15 year old. Her name was Abigail, and uh, she claims that the over thing in the story is that she lost her father because of two deployments to Iraq. He, uh, her father, is sustained injuries to his brain, uh, his spine, physical injuries, and he also has. PTSD. Apparently, he's been diagnosed with it. Okay, so that's the basic setting right. of the circumstance here. And if anybody wanted to watch this um, on the on the CBS yeah, site, go to CBS.com. Look up uh, CBS Sunday, Sunday morning, morning in the under the news segments, and I'm sure that you'll be able to find it very easily. Trigger to the rescue. It's called their tour. That's what the word their I was tour. looking for. Okay, they were returning go. from their tour. Thanks, Trigger. <laughs> um, see. 
you, you never know where your help's going to come from. Okay. Anyway, so they return from their tour of duty, as it were, at 2.37, 2 minutes and 37 seconds into the segment that's on CBS News' site. Uh, Abigail, again, the 15-year-old daughter, said, This is what Iraq did to my father. That's a quote from her words, okay? Because she was talking about the anger she built up because her father is nothing like now, like he was before he went on these tours of duty, because he has PTSD, other injuries, etc. So and then she says that almost, I think almost the next sentence, if not the next sentence, she says, I start blaming it on America's military. I'm telling you, this little 15 year old Gail is smarter than 99% of the public. She's right, and, and partly, obviously, because she, this, she's experiencing this firsthand. When I'm sitting here and I don't have my father going through this, it doesn't affect me the same, right? It's right. pretty easy for me as a 15-year-old man to say, yeah, we should go to war. Why? Because I'm, well, I'm not going. Right. Right? And that's what happened here. But at 2.42, only five seconds after she made that first comment that I quoted, she says, you guys stole my father. And, and my question to you about this and to everyone out there, is this just the cost of war? I think a lot of people will write off, well, hey, you know, it's dangerous business. People are going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. And you said earlier in the show that we didn't have a draft. So this dude said, hey, I want to I want to be in the reserves or I want to be in this arm of the military or whatever. So does not, he served his country, Tom. Does that not come with some risk? Yeah, except for I don't know exactly what you mean when you say served. I, I'm doing <laughs> so. nothing but trying to inflame things tonight. So we could go into a, a thing about that, but yeah, I mean, I think that's that's one of the, one of the many problems of this is that people think this is well. We can sit back and say it's the cost of war. Okay, so disclaimer time. Yes, you're not you're not blaming. What's the gentleman's name? Uh, Mr. Barton. You're not necessarily blaming Mr. Barton for being a bad guy. Okay, let's put all the cards on the table. Here we go. In part, I actually am. Okay. Okay, here's... here's wow, that's on American Tom. Yeah, uh, I've been there before. <laughs> I'll be there again. Here's the deal. I would argue Mr. Barton was duped by the state in getting him to volunteer. Now, and when I say in part, I do hold him responsible. Here's the part. I hold him responsible for being duped. Okay? Okay. And and I know you say, well, how can you be, because you have to be very careful in life, in everything, right? Everything that I do, I'm responsible for. If I'm a victim of fraud, after it happens and I realize it's fraud, because obviously you don't realize it when it happens, after you got to go, well, how was I uh, deceived, right? I thought I was looking at this critically. And what we can learn is, obviously I wasn't, and I have to take new measures to figure out this not to happen again. So let's not debate whether or not Mr. Bennett was an honorable man or not. Okay. So is, that, is that fair for the context of this story? Or is it important? Um, for, for context of this story, we'll say it's not important. All right. But I'm not going to, that doesn't mean it's not entirely important. All right. Unimportant. Sorry. Okay. Um, so he was duped, which is, by the way, the title of our show or something I can't remember. We should, see, we should be in practice saying that at the beginning of every show yeah. to let everybody know this is the episode you're listening to. But... He was duped by the state into thinking that the United States government is only going to engage in just wars, right? The problem is when you enlist or when you sign up, what's when you when you get a, a commission, I don't know if, if that's exactly the right terms there yep. to say, you, those are dangerous acts, first of all, because this is a, a warring... Uh, organization that you're joining. So I go, whoa, that's really dangerous to me, right? So you gotta be extremely careful. Secondarily, when you sign up, you don't actually know what circumstances are gonna come up, possibly in the next 20 minutes, let alone, I, you know, is a normal service, I think, four years? Is it normal term for so. listing? There's right. lots of different terms. Yeah, you don't know what's coming up. So I'm saying it's a very dangerous thing. You should be very careful, and by the way, it works more easily on younger people than it does on older people. Mm -hmm. um, also, of course, younger people are physically fit better than older people, so they're more desirable for a number of reasons. But I would argue the state is preying on the younger people um, because they can't. 
They're opportunists. Um, anyway, so I'd say be careful because it's a it's, it's a voluntary uh, draft. If you a voluntary draft yep. makes no sense. That's something the best word. It's a right. You you uh, volunteer voluntarily for, enlist. Yes, voluntary enlist. Um, but I, I would I would not recommend that anyone do that because I think uh, it's dangerous to to join a warring organization in general. But obviously, everyone needs to make their own decision. I'm not condemning anyone for doing that. I'm just saying uh, I would hope that people would think this through thoroughly before they make such a decision. Such a commitment, maybe, is the word. Okay. Um, but I'm saying the state is clearly duping people. Okay. Um, so th there's... So you're saying that this is a disrupt... Their engagement... Is it fair to say in their engagement in the Middle East is a dishonorable one? It's an unjust war. It's an unjust war. Okay. Why? Because, uh, and I'll do it really quick so we get through that. The only time it's a just war is when it's in defense. Okay. Okay. And I'm, I I get it. Wait a minute. Remember 9 11? Right. I, I was awake. Twin that, Towers. When Twin Towers and everything. But show me the connection to Saddam Hussein and say, well, things were evolving so quickly at the time. Exact. That's like, hey, I'm at an intersection and I can't see the cross traffic, so I pull out, right? Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. If you can't see the cross traffic, you don't pull out. That's the whole point, right? And so when people say to me, hey, it was evolving situation, blah, 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 at the time when we, when the United States entered the war, well, if it was evolving situation, wait till all the facts are available. What do you think, what's going to happen? What's the big loss of not getting involved today when we wait till tomorrow, right? Okay. So, but I would argue since there was no direct link, then it's not defense, right? What were we doing in Iraq? And of course, mostly the Obama supporters are going to tell us, well, it was Bush who duped us into doing that. Mm -hmm. And they're exactly right, by the way. But wait a minute, I'm not hung up on the name Bush, Obama, Clinton. I don't put any name there. It doesn't matter to me. I know the guy who liked the R's after their name, they really like it when the guys with the D's after their name, they can accuse them of something. And the guy with the D's really like them, you know, all big deal. For those of you at home, he's talking about Republicans and Democrats. Okay. Right. It, so He's an equal, equal opportunity basher. Absolutely. Because, because, again, I think the state is a coercive agency. There's my problem okay. in, in, in with the state. Okay. And, so let's try to get back to the story okay. of, of this. The story of this is, so my question is, is this merely a cost of war? Was the war justified? Right? We've asked that. I th really think it was not. Many, again, I, I even wrote this down, by the way. This is a, a professional that I am. Many believe Bush wanted to go to war, and of course he did. Mm -hmm. That adds more authority to the state. Well, we saw his poll numbers at the time. I think it went to like 93%, went crazy, yeah. and they were in the turtle right. you know, day a day before. Right. When 9 11 happened, bingo. All right, he's a leader. Yes. And that's the point. All presidents want to do this. Why? Because the system provides them the incentive to do that. Again, to my point that I made earlier. And if you don't believe me, see Dr. Robert Higgs' speech, because he even says the same thing. Okay. Um, what else did I want to say? And, and the, the last point on the state in this regard, in, in the national security state, the warfare state, as I like to call it, is it has but one tool at its disposal, and that's force, right? Mm -hmm. And there's my, again, more trouble with me with that agency. The only tool, the only thing they can do is either threaten you with force or use force against you. Again, I used this example a while ago. If I just dropped off a bunch of shovels at your door, and then a week later sent you a bill for it, first thing you say, yeah, hey, I never ordered freaking shovels. I'm not paying you for this crap. I'll say, nonetheless, you got the shovels, so you have to pay me, right? You go, au contraire, I don't, right? That's what happens with the state, right? I didn't ask him to do all this stuff. In fact, I told him I don't want him to do this stuff. I still have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, so regardless of, uh, and, and let's, let's talk about the way we measure that is with public opinion polls. Regardless of what those public, uh, public opinion polls say, they're going to go ahead and act as, as they think that they should. Yes, it's a crazy notion, this whole thing, what we have, this representative government. You elect, now you say, well, wait, we have a say. Wait a minute, back up the truck. You don't have a say.
first of all, you have one in three hundred million. What? How many people vote? I don't know. Hundred million, hundred fifty, whatever the exact number is in a in a presidential election. Mm -hmm. Again, all the other elections, who knows what the exact number is? We can go into that, but it's boring. Okay, so you have a a minimal, say at best, a lightning strike uh, ratio of of a say in the matter. Second of all, wait a minute. You don't even say that. You don't have that say in the matter. You have that say in the guy, the gal, who's going to represent you theoretically in these matters. And you say, well, I do it based on what they say they're going to do. Have they ever not done what they said they do? Right? Mm -hmm. So you really are saying, here, this guy, I'm entrusting him to do. And by the way, I can tell you 100% of the time, uh, if you're, say you're a giant Scott Walker fan, when I say you're a giant fan, there's a hundred issues. Governor of Wisconsin. Thank you. You might agree with 99 of them, but you don't agree with that last one, right? I, I don't know if anyone says, that dude is perfect, right? So you already, you're voting for a guy who's saying he's going to do what you don't want done, right? Okay. Not only, if that's, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt saying he's 99% of the way there. If he's less than 99%, obviously it's a worse condition for you. But second of all, there's no legal binding contract to hold him to that, those issues, right? So you're 99% of the way there, and then he doesn't do any of that. And he does, let's say, the only thing he does is the 1% that you didn't like. Or he changes his mind on something. Absolutely. It, so it just doesn't happen. So now what? Mm -hmm. So you don't have a say. I know I think people sitting there listening who haven't clicked the radios off yet, they're sitting there saying, well, wait a minute. How else could you do that? That's why you got to listen to the rest of the shows. This all unfolds over time. It's not as quick. And by the way, if I did have a quick answer for you, you wouldn't, it, it doesn't hit, it, it has to sink in through osmosis. It takes time. And as Brad says, that context to develop before you can get it. So just sit tight, relax, you know, and uh, it'll, it'll come to you. It just takes time. Those who stick in there, it will get to you. If you go away, then you'll probably never get the message. So I think in the end, I would invite everyone listening to to think about whether truly you have a say. Do you have an implicit say in any way that you are being represented? And, and I'll, I'll argue really quickly as best I can in a real short time. I'll, I'll tell you the system that you, you do have a say. And it's a significant say. It's actually a total say. It's called the free market. If you don't want to buy athletic shoes, you don't buy them. It's as simple as that. If you want them, you go buy them. It's 100% accurate. Whatever you want or don't want happens. Right? Mm -hmm. And I know people say, well, wait a minute. How could you apply the free market to the other things? To voting. Wait a minute. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, we'll get to that on, on next shows. But it actually, Good point. basically I'm saying free markets for everything. And again, you're sitting there going, holy cow, that'll never work. Give it a chance. I'll explain it to you. Yes. Not only will it work, it will work way better than what we have. We'll have a better society, and we'll all be better off. By the way, some studies have shown, and I'm not laying my concrete on this. It's not, it's not the foundation of my house. But I read a study saying if we had a free society since 1776 to today, the average work week would be 15 hours. Does that sound uh, appealing to you? So, so okay, we're going to come back to the free market. Yes. I'm not sure we have punctuated the story about the poor gal and the PTSD, but I think we have said what needed to be said about. Yeah. I encourage you to listen to that on your own and yeah. make your own opinion about what has happened. But again, those couple quotes, I think mean, okay. they were really important. And they stuck out to me anyway. Yeah. Um, and I know I think we, we're getting to the point where we need to wrap up and roll out of here. And before we do that, I just want to do a couple of. Uh, Dr. Robert Higgs's uh, quotes and and go over a few of the comments he made in that presentation. Okay. By, by the way, if you want to, I think you can YouTube Crisis Leviathan and the National Security State and put Higgs or Dr. Robert Higgs on there. You'll find it. I spell Leviathan. L E V I A T H A N. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I, the the most. I mean, of course, I've seen Dr. Higgs numerous times. I've seen him live a number of times. Uh, I think, again, I've said before, I'll say it again. He's a brilliant man. But I have to tell you, this thing that I saw only on YouTube, I did not see this live. 
he spoke with more determination and passion and emotion than I ever seen him before. He's very much in, in previous to this, I, I'd see him as a, an academic mm -hmm. um, and very matter of fact and lay out a, a logical case and make a real strong case. Um, but this one, of course he did that, but I saw him do it with emotion. So that was the thing that grabbed me the most to people who don't know Dr. Higgs and, and are listening to his presentation, I just, again, a couple comments. This is a quote from his. The state is the most destructive institution human beings have ever devised. Again, people are freaking out over that, but I just want to throw those out there. I, obviously, I, I totally see where he's coming from. He says, whatever promotes the growth of the state also weakens the capacity of individuals, blah, blah, to have freedom, basically. And, and I just trailed off that quote. That, but that's basically what he said. When, when you increase the state or grow the state, you reduce the capacity of individuals is the bottom line, right? It's a, it's a one uh, a, a, a pie, and if my slice gets bigger, your slice gets smaller. That's, by the way, not how the free market works. That's how the state works. Uh, and he says, of course, nothing promotes the state as much as nas a national emergency. And, of course, their favorite national emergency is war mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. Um, states, by their very nature, are perpetually at war. And, and he does make a point. He says, well, not necessarily uh, in a foreign war, but they're always, always at war domestically. And what he means by that is, as we I spoke of earlier, is you are coerced by them. So that is a state of war by definition. Um, the state gains its various sustenance by extortion. Most people call that taxation. If you really look at that, read The Law by Friedrich Bastiat. If you can read that book and tell me that taxation is not legalized theft, after reading that book, I, I don't know, I, we probably can't talk anymore because that is the most uh, conclusive argument I've ever heard. Um, by the way, that was also the deciding book that swayed Dr. Walter E. Williams, one of my heroes who's at George Mason University. Uh, let me keep going. State propaganda convinces people that they have a moral duty to pay taxes. I think that's great, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think it does. And not only the state propaganda, of course, the state has a strong connection to the mainstream media, which, again, the uh, Internet is greatest innovation of my lifetime. The state is not a protector, but a protection racket. So those of you uh, minarchists, uh, neocons, uh, of course we stand very differently there uh, because I'm with Dr. Higgs. I think it's a protection racket. You actually don't get protection from the state. You get the state on balance. They store, stir up more bees nests than they, they qualm. Mm -hmm. So in the end, you're worse off with that protection racket than what you think you're getting protection. Mm -hmm. uh, but an, uh, just a little tidbit of fact at the end here. He says, the number of federal homeland security contractors in 1999, how many, take a guess, and I know you didn't see this, how many federal homeland security contractors were there in 1999? How many federal homeland security contractors? Yes. Uh, not very many. Nine. Okay. In 1999. Ding, I got the right answer. Very good. There was nine. Right? I wouldn't have guessed that small, but this is what he reported. In 2006, how many? Okay. In 99, we started with the number of nine. In 2006, we are at? Uh, easily five figures. 33,890. Uh, I'm all right. I'm it's laying. A staggering in, number. Yeah, I'm laying in the ditch. Well, we're a lot safer. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that, I know that every time I get the full body cavity search on the way into my plane. Yeah, from nine to thirty three thousand eight hundred and ninety in six seven years, whatever. Okay, but wait a minute. The full cavity search or whatever keeps us from being on that Malaysian plane, right? Give me the free market, and I'll fix it for you in a heartbeat. <laughs> Next show. Stay tuned. This bat channel. Okay, wait, and he summed up his thing, and I just want to do this. He says, again, he, he, he finished with, the state is not your protector. It is your exploiter. And again, it's how you look at this and think about the concept of slavery that we spoke of mm -hmm. earlier in the show. Think about that a little bit. Those who call for the state for protection are those that are calling on the wolf to guard the sheep. 
that's that's not totally the end, but that was right towards the end of his presentation, how he summed this up. And of course, he made a brilliant case along the way. Okay, so how do you want people to be, what do you want people to be thinking after all the inflammatory things we've said tonight, Tom? <laughs> well, mostly I said. <laughs> yeah, I'm helping. Okay, thanks. Throw some gas on the yeah. fire. How, what do you want people to think as they, as we sign off, and and how they might, why they would want to listen again? Okay, this is my personal plea. First to Tanya, the state provides perverse incentives, right? It is an organization of aggression. I want them to think about that, and I know that sounds crazy to people. Okay. And the next thing I want you to think about, there is, in fact, a fantastic alternative, a much better alternative than what we have, and that's basically called a free society. Okay, so in Brad speak, I say, <laughs> I believe that, that our current system is not fair. Yes, many people say it's broken. It's broken, and I didn't think that there was ever a, an alternative. And, and I would add one more thing that was something that you said, and and that to being that alternative, and, and it, you taught me about natural law. And I think that it has been proven on occasion, and, and even it's being proven today, that we can get along without government intervention on everything. Right here in my hands is a piece of paper of my formerly nicotine stained fingers. <laughs> anyway, natural law is something we will definitely okay. get to. I'm glad you brought that up. I was reading, again, rereading The Ethics of Liberty from Murray Rothbard. Okay. Uh, for anybody who's a new listener, again, one of my heroes. Yep, Murray hear Rothbard. That name a lot. You'll hear that again. Um, fantastic uh, case. Uh, describing what natural law is, why it is, what it is, all that good stuff. So we talk a lot on this show about <laughs> different sorts of, uh, of governments and societies and so forth. Sometimes, I, will, I don't want to leave you thinking that we talk about those a lot because that would be a pretty boring show. But uh, I think we talk a lot about the democracy and the virtues of democracy that many people believe that it provides. And I'm convinced that what Tom talks about as far as a free society would be a better alternative and that it could work. And, and I think I'd just challenge everybody to listen um, along those lines and what, what Tom's last couple comments were. Yes, and by the way, you said we talk about stuff on this show. We've even talked about Russell Brand on this show. We have talked about Mr. Russell Brand on this show. I mean, show. we get all over the map. Yep. So uh, if you have any interest, stick with us, because you never know what we're going to talk about. Maybe you'll you'll listen to us and go, wow, I'm way more sane than them. Most people, <laughs> that's how they feel after they hang, hang with me. But challenge you to think, I think, is what we, in the end, would most like to do. Absolutely. And have to have that to be an outcome. Uh, on the lines of the national security state, again, I'll just repeat what Higgs said for our, my kind of closing thing. The state is not your protector. It is your exploiter. I know that seems crazy to people. Think about that. And again, there's alternatives, better alternatives. We haven't done them for a number of reasons, okay. um, which will continue to unfold in the next shows. With that, can, can't you just hear that outro music going right now? We right? can. It's great. Yeah. But, uh, and it's getting louder. It's in Mississippi. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Stick with us, everybody. We really appreciate you listening um, and joining us. We'll be back again next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. That's right. Find us on Facebook. Let us know your thoughts. Fire Tom a question or two. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, and my last sophisticated comment is, be there or be square. Well, that's original, Tom. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Thanks.